Hey, New Hope family, welcome back online. We miss you. I'm Pastor Luke. I'm super excited to be sharing this message that God has been laying and working and, and, and doing stuff on my heart. And so we're just so excited to have you tuning in with us right now. If you are around some people around you, just tell them, turn off your phone, get your notes and your Bible ready, because God is going to speak to us right now. Uh, we are still in our red letter series on the red letters of Jesus, the words that he spoke, the red letters meaning uh, in some Bibles that's highlighted in red what Jesus spoke, and those words are so true for today, for such a time as this, and they're so important, but I know through quarantine, there's been, and social distancing, there's been so many things that I've learned and God's been working in me, but here's some funny things that I've seen on the internet, but also learned through personal experience. I won't tell you which ones, but are some things that I have learned through quarantine, staying at home, and isolating is, uh, here's a couple things for you. If you sleep till noon, you only have to pay for two meals instead of of three, or you only have to make two instead of three. That works for me all day long. Uh, we know that eggs are healthy and they should be a foundational part of your diet, but if you don't like the taste of eggs, you can just add uh, some butter, some chocolate, some flour, and you just bake it for 30 minutes and that'll make it taste a lot better. Another thing is if you're feeling lonely, uh, grab a rubber glove, fill it up with warm water, and you can put it in your hand like you're holding someone's hand. That always helps. It's a little creepy, but who, who am I to judge? Uh, if you run out of cheese, you can't run to the store, or you're staying at home, you could always use some uh, orange posted notes. Just cover your sandwich right there. They don't taste as good, but they get the job done. Uh, if you run out of toilet paper, you can use a uh, hand towel roll, and you just saw that guy in half. You, know, you have two, two rolls of toilet paper and before when you had none. Uh, lastly, if you're into fitness or working out and you don't have access to a treadmill, go to your kitchen, grab some soap, uh, pour that soap on the floor, push against the wall, and start to run, and there you have your own DIY treadmill through quarantine uh, now, I know some of those are absolutely ridiculous and maybe funny to me, not funny to you, but I know through quarantine and COVID and really this season, it's been really difficult for a lot of people. And it's a season of anxiousness and uncertainty and stress. It's been remodeling our routines, our schedules, our priorities. And I don't want to downplay the seriousness or the stress of it all. And I also am not saying that God has authored or caused COVID, but what I do know is that in Romans 8, 28, it says, for we know that in all things God works, in all things he works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. And so God works in all things. He will work and has been working in the COVID quarantine season if you let him work in all things. I believe that he's working to help us look at our priorities, to shake up our routines. What do we really value? He's been asking questions to me in, in my life. And am I dependent on a building, a pastor, a service or an event for my relationship with Jesus? Do I depend on others or services just to meet with God? Do I need Jesus every day, or do I need him when I need something from him? Is Jesus my source, or is he my resource? These are all questions that I feel like God is working in my life and can be working in yours too. And what God has showed me through this time is that there's two things through quarantine that secretly separate, secretly separate you from Jesus, from the connection with him, from the source that he is. And, and Jesus has a lot of red letters dedicated to these two things. So get your notes out. The first thing of the, the, that secretly separates you is hurry. It's hurry, the life of hurry, a hurried lifestyle. Something I've noticed that when talking to people or making small talk with people, you say, hey, how are you? Good, just busy. 
or I'm, I'm very busy, but I'm good. Well, I'm crazy busy right now, but it's a good busy. It, it, I'm just busy. That's just how I am right now. It's the season I'm in. And, and I, I, I've said my, this myself automatically so many times, but I'm finding that I'm hearing it from young people, from old people, from, from men and women alike, from all stages of life. We are all busy, or at least we see ourselves as busy people. Harvard Business Review conducted a study on the change of social status over time, and it used to be that leisure was a sign of wealth. More money meant you, you retired earlier, you had more time. Now, busyness is a sign of wealth. The more time you sit around and relax, the less status you have. It used to be that the less you worked, the more status you had. People used to spend money to get time, and now they spend time to get money. It's reversed on how we value busyness. See, slow, the opposite of fast pace, which is a busy lifestyle, slow is a bad word in our culture and in our lives. When somebody has a low IQ, we call them slow. When service at a restaurant is bad, we call it slow. When a movie is boring, we call it slow. Merriam-Webster, to illustrate this, the dictionary uh, defines slow as mentally dull, stupid, naturally inert or sluggish, lacking in readiness, promptness, or willingness. Even our, the way that we define the word is so negative. Hurry has become a way of life for us. And if you have a hurried life, here are some symptoms that you can see. It, it, man, maybe I am in a hurried lifestyle, a busy lifestyle, moving you, you find yourself moving from one checkout line to the other checkout line because it looks shorter or faster. You're coming up to a stoplight and you're counting cars to see which lane you should get in so you could pull out faster. Or you're in traffic and you're desperately and maybe even dangerously trying to get into the faster or quicker lane just to save a minute. Maybe you're multitasking to the point where you forget other tasks at hand. That's me all the time because I can't just do one thing. It's not efficient enough. Uh, I get frustrated, or maybe you're frustrated when fast food takes longer than a couple minutes to get or to buy. Maybe you have a need for nonstop activity. You can't just sit, or you don't want to just sit. Or I know I'm, uh, this is guilty for me, is if uh, you're on the, uh, a web page or you're watching a video and it takes too long to buffer, so you just exit out of it and never watch it completely. That's been me so many times. We're all guilty of a busy life. The second thing that can secretly remove us or just, just keep us from connecting with God is distraction. So the first one is hurry. The second one is distraction. I spoke a little bit about this on Wednesday to our youth students, but uh, 2,617 is the number for today. That is the average times that you touch your phone screen per day, 2,600 times. There is only 1,440 minutes in every single day. So that means give or take a few, it's almost you're touching your phone two times a minute. Two times every minute you're going to your phone. See, that adds up to the, the four hours is the average number that you are on your phone a day. Not, I'm not talking talking, I'm talking smartphone, I'm doing something, the screen is on, I'm engaged. Four hours is the average. I've seen it, you, you know, even quarantine, it's, it's risen even more than that. So that's, if you add TV or media, other outlets other than your phone, that's an average of a four more hours a day. That is eight hours a day. So what is this telling me about our society? Is that distraction is a full-time job. It is a full-time, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week job that we are fully distracted. Things going on. See, distraction, the actual word, the Latin word comes from dis, which means apart, and trahere, to drag. To drag apart. What a word picture that it's dragging our attention. It's dragging our focus apart from what we really need to be on. The definition of distraction is a thing that prevents. Remember that word, prevents. Someone from giving full attention to something else. See, distractions pull you apart. They prevent you. They can't add anything to you. That's why we call them a distraction. 
Distractions only prevent. They only prevent us. They only take and hinder and keep from us. They can never add anything to our lives of meaning. I think we love to think of distractions like, like the movie Up. If you've seen that movie, the dog name is Doug, and he's talking, and all of a sudden, squirrel, and he can't stay focused because he's squirrel. And we think of distractions in that way where they just kind of are like pop-up ads and they just happen and all of a sudden we're there. But our brains work so fast that we have to realize that we are choosing to where we put our focus and attention. And so in order, you know, you have to choose the distraction for it to be a distraction. It's not just some pop-up ad or squirrel that runs by. We have a moment in our minds where we choose the thing that we give our attention to, that we give our focus to, and we are distracted. See, Satan loves to use hurry and distraction to, to uh, the John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, and I have come that they may have life and life to the full, to the fullest, to the abundance. That's Jesus speaking. Here's how Satan uses hurry and distraction to steal, kill, and destroy. Three things, three ways that Satan uses them. The first thing is they steal our opportunity. They steal our opportunity. Have you ever heard or done the gallon challenge before? If you have done it, you're a brave soul. I've done it a couple times. I regret it every time. But it's a challenge where you try to drink a whole gallon of milk in one hour. And it is not a pleasant challenge. It is physically impossible for your stomach to hold a gallon of milk. It doesn't work. So naturally, at a certain point in time, your stomach says, no more of this, and you throw it up. I know it's kind of a gross illustration, but we cannot hold that much. And, and usually when it comes to food or drink, being full is a good thing. But when it comes to the gallon challenge, you're too full. You're full on so much milk that it causes you to throw up. It is not pleasant. You get feeling of sick. It causes everything to, 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 to be weird about your body and different. And so there's a difference, though, between being full and being satisfied. I can be full on something like a gallon of milk and be the farthest thing from satisfied be the farthest thing from content or feel peaceful. See, hurry and distractions, that's, that's what they do in our lives. They fill up our lives. They fill up our time. They fill up our attention, our desires, our days, and ultimately our lives. And they will always fill us up, but they will never make us satisfied. They will never make us full of peace, full of being content at where we are. They can never give us true life like Jesus was saying that he gives. They only prevent us from things like the distraction uh, meaning. We, we, we're being prevented from Jesus and what he has for us when we are filled up on distractions and hurry in our lives. We can't have more of Jesus if we have more of everything else. It just doesn't work. We can't, our spiritual stomachs cannot handle it. You cannot have more peace, more hope, and more purpose in your life and have more of everything else. You have to choose. Charleston Southern University did a study of over 20,000 Christians across the globe, and it was a survey about obstacles to growth, specifically spiritual growth in your life, the obstacles. Busyness was listed as the number one obstacle to spiritual life. Not addiction, not sin, not doubt. Busyness. And it's so true. John Ortberg, a pastor, he says, For many of us, the great danger is not that we will renounce our faith. It is that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle, settle excuse me, for a mediocre, ver, mediocre, <laughs> mediocre version of it. We will just skim our lives instead of actually living it. Here is what hurry and distraction do for us. Take, take, let me take you down this road. We assimilate to a culture of busyness, hurry, overload, and distraction, and it leads to God becoming marginalized or compartmentalized in our lives. Then that leads to a deteriorating, dry, uh, and small relationship with Jesus. 
which then leads to us becoming more vulnerable to sin, to doubt, to selfishness, to fear, to anxiety, to addiction. Hurry and distraction are very physically the road that lead us to way worse things that will destroy our lives. Corey Ten Boom, you may have heard this quote, he has said, if the devil can't make you sin, he will just make you busy. Both sin and busyness have the same effect on our lives. They cut us off from true connection to God, to Jesus, to his Holy Spirit, to other people, and to your own soul. They cut us off. They prevent. We can't be full. And they steal our opportunity. The second thing that, or that hurry and busyness do is they kill our awareness. They kill our awareness. See, you, imagine you're going really fast in your car and you're on the passenger seat and you want to look down at the side of the road and try to see things. It doesn't work when you're going really fast. Everything gets blurred. It gets mushed together. You can't see details. You can't see specific things happening or what's going on. It's all a blur. You lose sight. But the slower you go, the more you notice, the easier it is to see things and to focus on things that are going on around you in that car. The same is with our lives physically and spiritually. The more we slow, the more we take a step back, is the more opportunity that we can become aware of what God is doing in and around our lives, how he's working, how he's speaking, if we would just slow and focus. But, but hurry and distraction, they kill our awareness of that. We're, too, we're moving too fast. We're not looking in the right direction in order to catch what God is doing. Jesus says in John 16, a, a pretty radical statement for that time. It says, he, it is better for me that I leave you and that I send my advocate who is the Holy Spirit. Th this statement must have shook the disciples, the people that he was speaking to because it's like, Jesus, we don't want you to go. You are everything. You're here with us right now. What more do we need? And Jesus is saying, no, there's somebody better. I'm going to send you somebody better. And, and I believe that Jesus made this statement to get them to move from depending on the person of Jesus to depending on the presence of God. They wanted, he, Jesus wanted them to recognize, I'm going to send you the person of the Holy Spirit, and he is going to have so much more presence in your life that I could not fulfill. It is better for us. Let that play out if we didn't get the Holy Spirit and Jesus was a person on this earth after he resurrected from the dead and he, st he stuck around to help. We would, Americans would have to get on a plane. We'd have to fly to Israel. We'd have to figure out where he was. We'd have to track him down. Once we got there, we would have to push through crowd after crowd after crowd just to get a glimpse of him. Much less if we got a conversation with him, it wouldn't get to be long because there'd be thousands of other people waiting. It doesn't work like that. That's why Jesus is saying, hey, I want to give you a greater access to me, to my spirit, to, to, to power, to peace, to so much more in your life, to truth. See, God is, God is omnipresent. He's all around us all the time. And not just that, if we give our lives to him, he sends his Holy Spirit, not just to be around us, but to dwell and live in us. What kind of access is that? That's so powerful. And with God's spirit and his presence, it's unlimited access. But here's the thing. Our, uh, so access to God's presence isn't the problem. Our attention to it is. Our awareness to God's presence in our life is the problem. When we're busy, when we're running around, when we're even busy of the mind and the spirit and, and distracted, we miss the presence of God in our lives. I know my wife knows this all too well, that I can be in a room with her and my focus is so far in left field or in right field that it, it takes my focus and my awareness that I, for me not to be mentally absent because God isn't the one that's absent. You may have felt that way before, but God is not the one who is absent. We are the ones who are absent. So the third thing is that they destroy our connection. Hurry and, dis and, and distraction destroy our connection. The thing with hurry and distraction is they can destroy your life without uh, your life looking destroyed. 
or looking like it's being destroyed. I have two roses here with me. And uh, we'll say in my right hand, this is rose A and this is rose B. Now you could look at these roses without a lot of examination, probably in the first split second and know what's going on here. You could look at rose A and go, okay, that one is healthy and alive. And you would look at rose B and go, she dead. She's dying. She's dying on you. You must not be putting water, whatever you must not be doing. But if I asked you which one, which one is dead, which one is alive, you would probably say B, right? But the real answer to this is that they're both dead. One of them just doesn't know it yet. Because if you notice, they're not connected to anything. There's no source there. There's no roots going down from a bush uh, that, that gives nutrients, that gives life. So no matter if you look like this, or if you look perfect, Henry and, Henry and Doris-like, they're both dead. They're both dead. They're both dying. And so, and, and neither of them are connected to the source of life. Even I, I even think in the context of church, Rose A might look to Rose B and say, at least I'm not that bad. At least I'm not that far. At least I still have some smell. I still have some color. I still have some petals. But you're still dying. It doesn't matter. And that's why distraction, that's why hurry are so dangerous in our life because they don't always look like they're destroying us, but they are. They are that's why Satan uses them, because we're not connected to the source. We're not connected to Jesus. And when we're so focused on other things, we can never be connected. And if you're not connected, you're dying. You're dying. It doesn't matter how churchy, how Christian you look. If you're not connected to Jesus, like he says, then you're dying. Then the parts of your life will be dying as well. So hurry and, hurry and distraction, they steal your opportunity, they kill your awareness, and they destroy your connection with Jesus. Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your whole life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Hurry and distraction have a way of us prioritizing our lives. We want to gain the whole world because we're going to try to fit everything in our schedule or we're going to try to focus on whatever is coming, whatever we want to choose, and at whatever moment we have. But Jesus is saying, you, you can gain the whole world, but you're going to lose your soul. You can gain the whole world, but you're still going to be dying if you're not connected to me. You're still going to be dying. And in, in quarantine, like I said, it, it really has given us an opportunity to look at some things, and I believe that quarantine's made us more hurried and more distracted than ever. But also quarantine, through quarantine, that we have been given more of an opportunity to be connected with Jesus than ever before. And how is this going to look coming back to service, coming back to, to church, coming back? Jesus is still the same God in your bedroom than he is on a Sunday morning church service in the sanctuary. And he wants to be connected to you. See, the solution isn't more time. We'll just fill that with other things. It is acknowledging and slowing down, saying, I'm hurried, I'm distracted. Where do I need to slow down? Where do I need to focus and prioritize in the midst of life? in the midst of life. We tell our students this, you are as close to Jesus as you want to be. You're as close to him as you want to be. It's a choice. It's a, pri it's a priority. What, what am I prioritizing in my life? Am I choosing other things or am I choosing Jesus to spend time with him? Not just once, but be with him and acknowledge his presence all day long. All day long. And this isn't some radical burn all your technology, stay away from it, it's the devil. You know, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying free up your schedule, don't commit to anything. You need to sit in your room, in your closet, and read the Bible all day and not have anything. That's not what I'm saying. You can have all that going on, but is Jesus your main choice? Is he your main focus? Is he your main priority? 
through all of that? Are you aware of his presence when you're running here and there during the day? Are you aware of his presence? Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28 Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. See, Jesus doesn't offer us a fourfold path of peace-giving enlightenment like Buddha did. He doesn't, he doesn't give us five pillars through submission like Islam does. Nor does he give us 10 ways to re- relieve your anxiety, which we self-help-oriented 21st century Americans are so drawn to. Unique to anyone else in human history, Jesus simply offers himself as the universal solution to all and everything that burden us. And when we are hurried and distracted, we don't bring those things to him. See, if you have... If you're sitting in your living room right now, wherever you're watching this, and you're feeling that tug on your heart saying, man, I've never fully given my life to Jesus. What does that mean? I've never made him my source of everything. He hasn't been my first choice. He hasn't been my priority. He, he, I've never surrendered to him, and therefore I haven't let him save me. God is speaking to you right now, and I wanna give you an opportunity. I'm gonna pray for you in a minute. But if, you, if you're responding in that way, I just want you to text HOPE. Text HOPE to 515-800-2014. We want to connect with you and pray with you and help you along this journey of making Jesus your source of life. And it'll change everything. But if you have, if you're on the other seat, and I've been a Christian for a long time, I know God has saved me, I'm not a, this is not a heaven or hell situation for me, but I recognize that there's a lot of hurry, and distraction going on in my life. And God's speaking to me about that. And I have to attract, uh, attack those roots of how Satan, I've been letting him in. You would say, how, how do I deal with this? Well, let me illustrate Jesus and how he lived it. Jesus was busy in the sense of his days were full. Imagine that. Savior of the world, born on a mission from the start. His days were full, yes, but he was never hurried and never distracted. He always stopped for people. Think of Zacchaeus in the tree. The woman that was suffering from bleeding, he stopped. Blind Bartimaeus, he stopped for. There's so many other stories. Jesus stopped for people. He wasn't in a hurry. Jesus took detours. We see to go heal people or help people. He took detours from where we knew it said he was going to this place, but he took a detour. You don't take a detour if you're hurried. He always took time to be quiet and alone to get to his source, the Holy Spirit and God. He always took time for that. He prioritized that. If he was too hurried or too distracted, he wouldn't have. He took time in his life to sit with a woman at the well and thus then from that conversation ultimately staying in that town longer. We see that he waited for three days when one of his good friends was sick and ultimately died. He waited. We see also that he's constantly eating with people, good, bad, and ugly. Constantly sitting with them, having a meal and talking. That doesn't sound like a hurried or distracted person to me. The way that he handled life, responsibilities, being the savior of the world, burdens, the pressure, the persecution, the people— He handled it full of power, full of purpose, and full of peace because he was patient, he was intentional, and he was slow. And we want that life. But if we want the life of Jesus, we need the lifestyle of Jesus. And his lifestyle was not hurried to become anxious and not satisfied, not distracted to miss out on what God is doing in the moment, but connected to his source, God, the Holy Spirit. So how is the Holy Spirit speaking to you about your lifestyle, about your priorities, about your choices, about hurry, about distractions? Once again, I'm gonna pray for you if you're accepting Jesus for the first time or if God's speaking to you for things. I believe he wants to do something in your life. But after I do this, Pastor Jeff is gonna wrap up 
And after this video ends, just take a moment before you get back to your routine and you're busy and you're crazy and distracted. Turn everything off and just take a moment with your Holy Spirit, with, with, with God who's with you. Just take a moment and see what he's saying to you about hurry and distraction and make a game plan with those around you of what you can do to walk in obedience and how he's calling you. Let me pray for you. God, we just thank you in the name of Jesus that you died for us, giving unlimited access to your presence and to your spirit. We are so thankful for that. And God, we apologize for living a hurried lifestyle, for living a distracted lifestyle and not putting you at the forefront, not using you or, or using you as our resource and not just our source of life. God, truly fill us up. Help us to reprioritize, to refocus in, to realign, to do whatever is necessary to slow down and focus in. God, for those people that are making a decision right now to give you their whole life for the first time, we pray over them. Pray a blessing over them. Would you guide them and lead them, Jesus, in a lifestyle like yours that is not hurried or distracted, but full and alive. God, help us to have the courage to walk in obedience for the things that you're calling us to do. We thank you, God, for the change and, and, and really the power and the peace that are gonna come in these next days and months from focusing in, realigning to you as our source. We praise you, Jesus, and we thank you in your holy name, amen. We love you, New Hope family, and please take advantage of that moment and see what God is calling you to do. We will see you soon. We love you.